Hello, today we're continuing with our series on nuclear physics looking at thermonuclear fusion reactors. You may remember in the last video we postulated that we might be able to do fusion by simply using hydrogen, Put add two hydrogen nuclei, fuse them together, that would give you 2,2 helium, but we said you couldn't do that because there isn't a 2,2 helium. So a better thing to do is to take an isotope of hydrogen, which is deuterium, one proton, one neutron, and if you fuse those together, yes indeed, you now get 4,2 helium, which is perfectly valid, plus energy. And that energy could be used to boil water, produce steam, drive a turbine, drive a generator, produce electricity. And that looked to be very good because we said the deuterium is plentiful, it's in the sea, the waste product is helium, which is an inert gas, there's no radioactivity. So you've got the best of all possible worlds, cheap, plentiful fuel, no radioactive waste product, and no radioactivity in the process itself. Brilliant. But I'm afraid, as we shall see in this uh, video, that that's not the best way of doing it. In fact, there's a better way, which is to take deuterium, but actually fuse it with another isotope of hydrogen, which is tritium. That has one proton and two neutrons. And that produces helium plus a neutron, plus energy. Quite a lot of energy, actually. 17.6 MeV for every fusion reaction that takes place. I'll show later on why that is the better approach. But it does come with a, a little bit of a disadvantage. Firstly, tritium is a little bit radioactive. So we've now introduced some radioactivity that we didn't really want. But you'll notice that the products are not radioactive. We've got helium, a neutron, and heat, which comes out in the form of, uh, and energy, which comes out in the form of heat. One big problem is that tritium is not readily available. You can't get buckets of that out of the sea. But you can make it. You can make it with lithium. What you do is you take that neutron that's been produced in that reaction, that's a 0-1 neutron, and you bash it up against lithium-3, and that produces the tritium that you need, and that goes there, plus helium, which of course is an inert gas, perfectly safe. So if you surround your nuclear fusion reactor with lithium, then the neutrons that are produced here will bash into the lithium. That will produce tritium and helium. The tritium then immediately fuses with a deuteron to produce perfectly harmless helium and another neutron, which goes through this process again. So in theory, at any rate, although there is a radioactive process going on, firstly, you don't have to go and mine the radioactive material. You make it inside the fusion reactor by bashing a neutron against lithium. And secondly, that radioactive material should all be used up when it fuses with deuterium, leaving you just with harmless helium. In practice, of course, there's bound to be some radioactivity left. But it's trivial compared with the amount of radioactivity you have with fission reactors. So this is still desirable. But why have we decided that it's better to have this deuterium-tritium reaction rather than just a plain deuterium-deuterium reaction? And the answer is all to do with the amount of energy you get out from this process compared with the energy that you have to put in. So if we have the energy out on this side and the energy in on this side, the curves are not straight. The curves look like this. This is a deuterium plus tritium reaction. This is a deuterium plus deuterium reaction. And you can see that for any given energy in, let's say we put that much energy in, for deuterium, deuterium, you will only get that much energy out, but for deuterium, tritium, you will get a much higher amount of energy out. That's why the deuterium, tritium uh, route is favoured. There's also another problem. You remember I said that we've got this big reservoir of our products, deuterium and tritium, if necessary, or deuterium, deuterium, 
and they're all bashing into one another at very high energy because they are all at very, very high temperature. So they're all flying about, smashing into one another, rather like very high energy billiard balls. The, they are constantly changing velocity as they bash into one another. They are constantly accelerating and decelerating. And this is, remember, a plasma. It's so hot that the electrons have been, are able to escape from the atoms and leave ionized material. So there are positively charged nuclei and negatively charged electrons, and they are constantly accelerating and decelerating. What do we know about charged particles that accelerate? They radiate energy away, and they radiate that energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation, um, gamma rays typically for this sort of temperature and energy. And that's called bremsstrahlung, breaking radiation. So some of your energy out is useless to you because it comes out not as the heat that you want, but as electromagnetic radiation. And that's wasted. So you've got to get an energy out above the wasted Bremsstrahlung radiation in order for this to be effective. And you can see that the point at which you get more energy out than you put in after you've taken account of the wasted energy is about 4 keV for the DT reaction, but it's something like 40 keV for the DD reaction. So you can get more energy out if you can have 4 keV with the DT reaction than with 40 keV with the DD reaction. And remember, energy is related to temperature. So you don't need such a high temperature. So let's just think a bit about what the energy is that you get out and what the energy is that you need to put in. We'll start off by assuming that you've got Nx of the X particles, that might be the deuterium, Ny of the Y particles, that might be tritium, and let us say that those two together make a total of N particles. And uh, just to be, uh, to keep it simple, let's assume that Nx is N over 2 and Ny is N over 2. So there's N particles, half of them are deuterium, half of them are tritium. Okay, fairly straightforward. Those are the atoms. The trouble is those atoms have become ionized. So you've now got Nx nuclei and Nx electrons, and then you've got Ny nuclei and Ny electrons. And the total of that lot is going to come to 2n, right? If nx and ny equals n, then the total number of individual particles, that is ionized particles, will be 2n. The energy of a single particle, average, is 3 over 2 kT. That's of one particle. So the energy of all the particles will be 3 over 2 times kT times the number of particles, which is 2n. Two's cancel, and that's simply three times t times t times n, where n is the total number of atoms. So that's the energy that you have to put in, and that will determine the temperature. The rate of reaction we've already shown is equal to nx ny times this factor sigma v, the number of x, the number of y, and that combination of cross section and velocity. Nx, we said, was n over 2, and ny is n over 2, so nx ny is n squared over 4. So that's going to equal n squared over 4 times sigma v. That's the rate. Now, the actual energy out is going to be the rate times the time you allow it to happen times the energy you get out from each reaction. So it's the rate, n squared over 4, sigma v times the time for which this happens because remember this is a rate per second so we've got to multiply by a time times the energy you get out for each fusion reaction which we'll call q so that's the energy you get out this is the energy you put in that's the energy you get out so it's pretty clear that we want the energy out n squared over 4 sigma v tau q that has got to be greater than the energy you put in 3 k t n 
And you'll notice that the N cancels here with one of the N's there. And what we can now do is to rearrange this formula for the product of N tau. That is the product of the number of particles and the time of the engagement. So N times tau has got to be greater than, well, 4 times 3 is 12 kT divided by, what do we got left here? This sigma V term times Q. It's just this term here, rearranged for N times tau. Bring everything out on the other side. And that is called the Lawson criteria. That the number of particles times the time of engagement must be greater than this um, value here. Now, T is obviously a variable, but that doesn't mean the rest are constants because sigma and V will also vary according to T. So if you plot n tau against t, that's what we're going to do now. So we plot n tau, the number times the time of engagement, against the temperature t. I said it won't be a straight line because the other values are going to vary as well. And what you find is you get something like this for dt and something like this for dd. And this is at a minimum... So the minimum number times time of engagement arises at this temperature, and for dt, that's 25 keV. So that is your best energy to achieve the most efficient fusion. But 25 keV, let's just remind ourselves what the temperature is. Temperature is energy divided by Boltzmann's constant which is 25 times 10 to the 3 eV, divided by Boltzmann constant, which is 10 to the minus, 9 times 10 to the minus 5 eV per K. And that, or 25 divided by 9 is, call it 3. 10 to the 3 divided by 10 to the minus 5 is 10 to the 8 K. 300 million K. Not quite so bad as 8 billion K, which is what we calculated earlier, because instead of having 720 keV, we've now found that we can get the fusion we need with 25 keV. And that requires a temperature of 300 million K. And that will give us an efficient fusion reaction where the energy out will be greater than the energy in. But of course, we've now got a problem, which is if we've got this plasma at 300 million K, what are you going to put it in? Because anything you put it in is going to melt. So here are the walls. And here is just one of the, let's say, the nuclei traveling at speed V. And on no account must that be allowed to hit the wall. Otherwise, the whole thing is going to melt down. Well, we can always resolve this into two components. We can have a, a, a vertical component of the velocity and a horizontal component of the velocity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a magnetic field in this direction. And where there is a magnetic field in the presence of moving charged particles, there will be a force. That force classically is equal to the charge on the particle ti uh, times V cross B, where V is the velocity and B is the magnetic field. And this is what's called a cross product, and it has two important features. The first is that if the velocity and the magnetic field are in the same direction, there is no force. The second is that the force is always perpendicular to both V and B. So if we take those two things, we find that if B and the horizontal component of the velocity are in the same direction, which they are, there will be no force. Consequently, the horizontal velocity just carries on parallel to the sides. That's good. However, this magnetic field acting on the vertical component of the velocity will cause a force, and that force will be perpendicular to both B and to V, which means it will be either into the paper or out of the paper. And it will continue to be perpendicular. And the consequence of that will be that the vertical component just goes round in a circle. So the combination of 
a vertical component that's going around in a circle because of this magnetic field and a horizontal component that's not affected by the magnetic field is that it simply spirals along not touching the walls. Now I hear you say but there'll come a point surely where it will have to touch the end wall and then disaster will strike. Well not necessarily because what we can do is to bend the whole thing round into the shape of a donut and if we do that of course we can't just use a a simple magnetic field anymore because we've changed the shape so we have to be a bit more subtle about our magnetic field but essentially what we can do is to get these particles to spiral around the donut its technical term is torus and they never hit the walls so we've cracked it we have found the criteria that determine the most efficient way of achieving fusion such that the energy out is greater than the energy in we found a way of making sure that the plasma doesn't touch the walls and cause it all to go into meltdown. So what's the problem? Well, the problem, of course, is essentially an engineering one. When I did my degree 40 years ago, fusion, uh, uh, commercial fusion reactors were thought to be about 20 years away. Today, they are thought to be 20 plus years away. There's still an awful lot of engineering to be overcome, engineering problems to be overcome. There are two major projects. There is the ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, and the JET, the Joint European Taurus. These are both international collaborations of scientists. And the best that has been achieved so far is that the energy out is approximately equal to 70% of the energy in and that's no use because you're putting more energy in than you're getting out not good for a commercial reactor but in the course of the next 20 years or so it is hoped that these projects will find the engineering solutions that will deliver the kind of energy that we need and frankly if you can do that you solve the world's energy needs for millions of years to come because there's a plentiful supply of water there's a plentiful supply of the raw products. The, the whole thing is solved. Some of you watching this video might indeed go into working on uh, this work and you may well be the one who leads to the breakthrough that leads to successful nuclear fusion reactors. Of course, the sun has been doing all this for five billion years. How does that manage? That's what we'll cover in the next video.